Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. As we like to do on Monday, we bring in other projects, products, and have people give us a, an intro tutorial overview of what they're doing. And um, we've all probably heard of the Elk Stack or Elastic and all of those things, but I thought it was high time we got an update on um, what was going on in the Elastic Cloud, and especially since they've now built an operator. So we have uh, Peter Brockwitz, who is here with us from Vienna. Um, that's why he's a little in the dark over there, but um, we're going to have him talk for uh, and give us an intro tutorial to um, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, and we'll have some demo, and then there's time at the end for live Q&A. So wherever you are on um, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, or here in um, BlueJeans, please just ask your questions in the chat and we will relay, relay them to Peter um, and have a conversation at the end. So um, welcome everybody and Peter, um, go for it. Take it away, introduce yourself and let's hear all about Elastic Cloud. Yeah, thanks Diane for the introduction. So my name is Peter, as you've heard, I'm a software engineer. I'm working for Elastic on what we call Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes. And it's also what I'm talking about today. Um, let me see if I can my slides. Um, so the Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes is a, the way, the official way to run the Elastic Stack on, on Kubernetes. And maybe it's uh, worth sort of taking a step back and, and reminding ourselves what we mean uh, by Elastic Stack. So as you might know, at the heart of the Elastic Stack is um, Elastic Search as a distributed um, data store and search and analytics engine. And of course, we have a sort of window into that stack through Kibana, which is a sort of extensible uh, visualization and UI application. Um, and that enables the three solutions we, we currently have, which is enterprise search, which gives teams the ability to unify sort of data from multiple data sources into a unified search experience or allows them to add a search box to their application that's uh, powered by Elasticsearch. And Elastic Observability, which is what we're looking at closer today, um, also during the demo later, uh, which is of course the ability to sort of uh, look, observe your infrastructure through logs, metrics, application performance monitoring data, uh, and uh, uptime data and things like that, and alert on it. And finally, Elastic Security, which is a SIM solution and has also an, an endpoint component. So all of these have also small uh, binaries of processes behind it, which is something to keep in mind, because what we are interested in is actually orchestrating this later on on Kubernetes. Um, so, in order to get data into Elasticsearch, we have these um, data shippers, uh, Beats and Boxdash. Beats comes in in many uh, flavors, sort of metric beat for metric data, file beat for files, and so forth. Um, but now coming back to the question, how do you how do you run this? Um, of course, the easiest way is to use our hosted uh, SaaS offering called Elastic Cloud. It's the easiest way because all you have to do is say, I want to run this product and that product and tell us how many resources you want to use and we take care of the rest. Um, now it could be that for some one reason or another, regulatory or legal or some other requirement, you're not able to run on a public cloud or and have the requirement to run on your own infrastructure. And this is where Elastic Cloud Enterprise comes in as sort of an on-premise version of Elastic Cloud. And finally, and this is what we're focusing on today, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, which aims to give you a similar experience as Elastic Cloud Enterprise, but on Kubernetes. Um, so today, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes is just an operator, and a Kubernetes operator available in, on Operator Hub IO. And with the latest release, it's also going to be a Red Hat certified OpenShift operator. Um, now, why, why do we need an operator to run uh, Elasticsearch um, or the Elastic Stack on Kubernetes? Well, you could say, can I not just uh, create the necessary Kubernetes objects myself uh, to run these applications? And the answer is yes, maybe for simple uh, use cases. But as soon as we think about sort of um, beyond a simple proof of concept deployment, 
um, it becomes clear that sort of an, uh, we need more power and more uh, capabilities to run this. Um, and let me illustrate this um, by going back to that slide that we looked at just earlier and looking at this slide again and think about what kind of applications are these and what requirements do they have in order to run them as an orchestrator? So which of these applications are stateful and which of them are stateless? And then realize that Elasticsearch, of course, sort of at the center of this is the stateful application that all the others are relying upon to persist their state. So this is also the most interesting application from an orchestrator point of view, and which is what I'm focusing on today mostly. So Kubernetes, of course, has support for stateful workloads in form of stateful sets, um, but there's other things to take into consideration, right? So we need to start thinking about storage to persist the state. So we need to think about volume management. We need to think about choosing a storage provisioner that has offers good enough performance for an application like Elasticsearch. And then, and this is the other focus of this um, presentation, I guess, is you need to think about what happens after you've initially deployed this cluster. Um, what if your requirements change? You need to scale up or down, or you want to change the architecture of your cluster um, because you have a new use case you want to incorporate. And then I think uh, it becomes clear that we need um sort of take extra into consideration that not all Elasticsearch clusters are uniform. The simple, a simple cluster with, with like this one that I illustrate here might be something you start out with. Um, I don't know how much you know about Elasticsearch, but in Elasticsearch we have this concept of node roles that basically determine what Elasticsearch node does in the cluster, the master responsible for cluster state and reaching consensus and cluster membership and things like that, data role to store data on the node, ingest to run ingest pipelines and ML to run ML jobs. And in a simple topology like this one, it's all co-located in the same physical node. They play all the roles together. But as your um, as your use of a cluster grows, what people start to do is sort of factoring their, these out into different tiers. So then you have suddenly a cluster where not all nodes are uniform anymore, but they have different roles. So one thing people tend to do is sort of pull out the master nodes in a dedicated set of nodes just to isolate them from any spikes in traffic and make sure that your cluster uh, stage stays available at all times. And then as more there are more advanced use cases, of course, where you then pull out every kind of node into its separate tier. And if you have a lot of time series data, it might even make sense to differentiate the data tier itself into what's called a hot, warm, cold architecture, where we move data um, that starts out on a so-called hot node, has very power, powerful hardware and contains data that you search a lot. Um, for example, log data of the last couple of days. Um, you move it over time to cheaper hardware that's maybe a little bit slower, but um, as the data becomes less relevant for you, that's a good compromise to save on, on money and sort of slowly move the data. Um, I'm not. The main purpose of this is not to explain the different kinds of Elasticsearch topologies or cluster architectures to you. Just the one thing to take away of this is that not all Elasticsearch nodes are uniform. And if we come back to that, what I said about the need to manage Kubernetes resources, and we think about how stateful sets work in Kubernetes, and we realize that we cannot create such an architecture with a single stateful set, right? Because a stateful set has one part template, can create one uniform type of node. So if you want to implement an architecture like that, we need multiple stateful sets. And I mean, this is when you realize that managing this manually is a lot of work. And this is where an operator has sort of unique capability. Uh, so just a quick reminder, I'm sure everyone um, knows how operator work, but just to remind ourselves sort of the main feature we are using here is at the extensibility in the Kubernetes API server through custom resource definitions that allow us to introduce our own types into the Kubernetes API. So on the right hand side, you should see an example of how a Elasticsearch cluster spec looks uh, based on our CRD for it. 
So you see what I said earlier about different tiers of nodes, we call them node sets here that I have defined two um, sets of nodes, three master nodes, two data nodes. And the second pillar of an operator is then um, an actual process running in your Kubernetes cluster, of course, um, which has access to the Kubernetes API and um, watches as users make changes to these custom resources. As they create and spec out Elasticsearch clusters, for example, it responds to these events and starts a process that we call reconciliation, where it sort of compares what the user had specified. I want to have a cluster with these and these nodes um, and tries to compare what it sees in the Kubernetes cluster at this time and try to tries to work towards that desired state the user has expressed. So it's maybe a little bit abstract. Let's um, take this example from before. So this Elasticsearch cluster with two different sets of nodes, master nodes and data nodes, translates then under the hood into two stateful sets that we manage, one with three nodes, three master nodes, and one with uh, two data nodes. But actually, um, that's not all. But there's a lot because there's a lot of sort of supporting actors here. There's uh, config maps that we mount into the pod for configuration files, for secrets, for TLS data, um, or user and password information, or the so-called KISO, which is a way in Elasticsearch to specify sensitive configuration information that shouldn't be in a clear text file. So there's a lot more Kubernetes resources to manage um, and to create. And then we need to front all of this with Kubernetes services because uh, Elasticsearch is sort of a distributed data store is fronted by a RESTful API that we can expose through a Kubernetes service. So the operator does all that during reconciliation. It looks at the cluster. Do we have these stateful set that we expect to have, if not create them? Do we have all the supporting Kubernetes objects, if not create them? And we go beyond that as well by interacting with then the Elasticsearch cluster that we create directly. And on the one hand, of course, that's in order to apply configuration settings. Um, but on the other hand, um, we also, and there come, we come back now to this idea of sort of day two operations where your cluster topology changes over time. Um, we, we take special care when we uh, enact these configuration changes. So consider, for example, a scale down. You maybe have over-provisioned your cluster or you, you're migrating away from one topology to another. So you're scaling down one type of nodes and you're scaling up another type of nodes. Um, so we take extra care that we migrate the data away from a node before we decommission it. And that's not to say that Elasticsearch doesn't have its own recovery mechanisms to deal with failures, but it's rather that this is more, this is a planned uh, configuration change. So we want to have a smooth transition um, and we don't want to rely on the uh, failure or failover mechanism in Elasticsearch. And similarly for rolling upgrades, um, so rolling upgrades is when we sort of apply new configuration to all the nodes in the, in the cluster, but we do this one node at a time. Again, we interact with Elasticsearch here um, and basically tell it, if you will, um, hold on a second, we're going to take down this node, no need to panic, no need to recover the data, it's coming back in 30 seconds with new configuration. So again, what, we try, what we're doing here is making sure that the rollout of configuration changes and the transition from one topology to another is smooth and without interruption and without um, downtime for the users. Um, now I showed this very simple manifest earlier that, we, that you can use to spec out your cluster. For advanced users, um, we also give uh, a lot of power by exposing the pod template, which the stateful set, the underlying stateful set uses directly through our custom resource definition. So this allows you to, for example, add additional metadata to uh, Elasticsearch nodes, to use affinity node or pod, affinity or anti-affinity, or to tweak the JVM. So Elasticsearch is a JVM-based application, um, and you can sort of tweak it here with uh, environment variables, like in this example. 
coming back to this idea that we're using stateful sets under the hood to orchestrate the different tiers of nodes we have in Elasticsearch Cluster. But not only means that every pod has a stable network identity, it also means that it has a, a stable association with a persistent volume. And it makes a lot of sense, of course, if we're talking about a stateful application after all. But we need to give users the ability to, to have an influence on how these volumes are created. So this is why we're exposing in the manifest as well, the volume claim template, where you can tweak, for example, how big the volume should be. So in this case, for example, 100 gigabytes. And most importantly, which storage class should be used to create it. Um, and that has, of course, a lot of impact on the performance of that volume. And you need to sort of make uh, an educated decision based on your use case uh, what kind of storage class you, you use. So there's the network attached storage offerings from the cloud providers that provide decent performance for many use cases. And of course, for ultimate performance, you, you probably want to use uh, local volumes, local NVMe based volumes. Um, so to summarize, um, Elastic Cloud and Kubernetes as it is now is an is an elastic is an operator a kubernetes operator um allows you to deploy elastic search kibana apm server beats an enterprise search on kubernetes and when i say on kubernetes i mean uh, vanilla kubernetes openshift and the hosted uh, kubernetes offerings from the major cloud providers um, i'm going to show how the interaction model works in the demo and we talked a little bit about already about the support of sort of moving from from different topologies to another and rolling out changes and version upgrades the operator itself is open code so you can take a look on our github it's uh, github elastic slash cloud hyphen on hyphen kates um, where you can see what we do under the hood where you can open issues where you can open pull requests if you want to uh, and uh, get in touch with us as well um, we just released um, version 1.3 of, of Elastic Cloud and Kubernetes, which is going to be the first release, which is going to be a certified operator. And it has a, a, a new feature to allow volume expansion, which I'm going to demo. And we also have for people who are invested in the Helm universe, we also offer the operator as a Helm chart now. And we have fixed some issues around IPv6. Um, I think that's all I had in terms of slides, and I would now switch to the demo. Any questions so far? So far, you're hitting it out of the park, Peter. So um, keep going, and, and we'll get the questions at the end. Sounds good. So I have a set up a dev environment here, an OpenShift dev environment, and uh, there's currently no operator installed. So I can go now to Operator Hub and just search for Elastic. And you see the Elastic operator here. Um, in a few, I hope very soon you will see the certified operator there as well. I'm opting to install this in all namespaces. And in a few moments, we should see um, the operator pop up in this view. Um, This this is how you know it's a live demo. It takes time. Yeah, yeah we need some elevator music now. Um, I've taken the liberty to uh, create a project ahead of time here. It's called Elastic Monitoring because we're focusing on um, the observability use case. So we see what I mentioned earlier about the custom resource definitions. So each of them is an API extension basically is listed here as provided APIs. And we can now go ahead and maybe start creating an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, we can do this, um, just use a different, um, a different spec that I've prepared ahead of time, which has the latest version of Elasticsearch. And we're starting out, as I said, with a very simple topology, uh, just one group of nodes, three nodes, eight gigs of RAM, and I'm giving half of the RAM uh, to the JVM as heap space, which is recommended if you have this kind of mixed role setup. And then 
The other thing we also covered in the presentations earlier is I'm specking out a volume claim template here for 50 gigs. And the last setting at the bottom is just because I haven't tweaked the kernel on this dev environment. So I'm turning off some memory mapping feature in Elasticsearch, which on production environments gives you extra performance, uh, but we don't need that for the demo. So I'm hitting create. And um, what we can see now is that um, it's, the operator kicks into live uh, and starts deploying this. And we can actually use the OpenShift console to see the stateful set. As I said, we have just one set of nodes, uniform at this point time, um, back and we see the pods coming up. Now, the next thing we want to do is um, have a Kibana in front of that so that we have actually something visual to see and I don't have to demo everything with, with APIs. And for that, I'm going to switch to the command line um, so that you can also see how the interaction works from command line tooling. Um, let me fire up my editor here, which is let me actually let me deploy it first and then show you what I'm doing afterwards. Um, so we save some time. And now I fire up my editor. So this is the second custom resource definition or the custom resource in this case, it's kind is Kibana. I give it a name, I use the same namespace, give it a version, I just want one instance. And this here is where the magic happens basically, where we say, I want to automatically connect this to an Elasticsearch cluster called Elasticsearch, um, which is, if we go back to the UI for a second, um, which is the Elasticsearch cluster we created just um, moments ago. And what the operator then starts doing is sort of setting up certificates, setting up a user with minimal privileges for this and making sure that that association works between these two applications. The only other thing I'm doing here uh, is I'm using the uh, OpenShift uh, service serving certificate feature to get a trusted um, TLS certificate for Kibana. And then I'm using this here in, in, the, in the spec later on. Um, now, in order to access Kibana from outside the cluster, we also need an OpenShift route. I've um, prepared that as well. So I'm um, using a Let's Encrypt certificate here and pointing the service that um, Kibana has. So let me actually show this briefly to you. So the exposing, the exposing Kibana and as well as Elasticsearch to Kubernetes services, as I mentioned in the presentation briefly, and the route I'm about to create is going to target exactly that, um, that service. We'll go back to our, our um, so I, we can check if Kibana is up. So Kibana, as I mentioned, is a, is a, basically a stateless application. So we're just using the deployment here to uh, to roll it out into the Kubernetes cluster. And click through to that, we see the Kibana pod is, is up and running. We can also monitor the health of these applications that we just have deployed by, uh, using the standard command line uh, tooling. You can use abbreviations. You don't have to spell out Elasticsearch or Kibana. I'm using the abbreviation here. And we see that both reporting green health so let me go now to my to the domain I'm using uh, for this. Um, actually, this doesn't sound right, but yeah, that's more like it. Um, I'm seeing a login window now. So how do we log in? Um, there's a built-in user called Elastic that I'm going to use. And what we're doing is we're exposing the password for this user through a Kubernetes secret. Um, it's called... Uh, Elasticsearch, so the name of the cluster, as Elastic user, and then I can just use a little bit of command line um, to pull that out. Now there's something obstructing my view. To do it, um, and actually there's a new line in that, so we need to use some some built-in shell functions to Trim that off, and I'm going. There's in macOS. There's a function to copy stuff from the command line into your pasteboard. I'm using that as well. 
then that should give me the password. Um, for production environments, what you're go probably going to do is not do that all the time, but instead uh, configure SAML or some form of single sign-on instead. But for the demo, I think that's um, maybe too much for now. So what we see now is uh, Kibana, and I said we're going to look at observability a little bit today during this demo, and we see there is nothing there. There's no, no data in there. So how do we get data in? If you remember what I said earlier about the Elastic Stack, then Beats is the way to go um, to ship data into Elasticsearch. So how do you go about, let's say we want to start monitoring this Elasticsearch cluster itself. Um, what I what a, is a good starting point is our documentation page for Elastic Cloud and Kubernetes. It's on the elastic.co website slash guide. And then you just click through to Elastic Cloud and Kubernetes. And there we have a section for um, each individual application that we support. And as we're interested in Beats now, there is in the Beats chapter, there is a subsection with configuration examples. And that's a good starting point because these Beats configurations, it's usually a lot of YAML. So it's a, it's a good idea to start with um, one of these examples. So I'm going to use the stack monitoring example so that we monitor the cluster we've just created itself. So what I've done is I've just taken that, um, I've just taken that example. Let me apply it first. Um, then show you what it does. So this is a, a, the third custom resource I'm introducing now. We had Elasticsearch and Kibana. This is Beats. Um, same principle, a name, a namespace, a version. The type is metric beat because we want to get the metrics from the Elasticsearch cluster. And then again, this Elasticsearch ref element that we've seen before that automatically sets up the connection to Elasticsearch. And then we're using metric beat configuration to extract Elasticsearch specific metrics. So that's a, a, a a specific integration for Elasticsearch, and there's multiple integrations in metric beat for different kinds of common applications. And I'm targeting um, an Elasticsearch cluster that has these labels on. Um, now, in order to um, have these labels on, I, I also, um, sorry, drawing widely through that document, I also applied a configuration change to Elasticsearch itself to add this metadata to the pod template. So this is the cluster from before. All I did was adding a little bit of metadata here so that Metrobit can target this specific cluster. And this is a good opportunity to take a look at how we roll out changes in Elasticsearch clusters. So you see, it's terminating the second node because I've been talking so long. It's already updated the Elasticsearch as default two node. So it's doing one node at a time, terminating it, waiting for 30 seconds to drain connections to the node, rolling out the change, booting it up and the pod, recreating the pod, um, and then waiting for the cluster to be healthy and then continues with the next node. And so in a, a very safe way, it's rolling out this configuration change across the whole Cluster, it takes a little while, um, but it makes sure that sort of um, we don't lose availability during that process. I'm not going to sit here and watch how, how this is rolling out. We are almost done anyway. Um, instead, I think I want to um, roll out two more things in that cluster, and that's I don't want to. I don't want to only monitor my own Elasticsearch cluster. I also want to monitor Kubernetes itself. So I'm going to roll out a daemon set for metric beat that allows us to monitor Kubernetes and file beat to extract logs from all running containers. Again, I'm, I'm using these examples from our documentation page, and let me first apply them so we save time. Um, and then I'm explaining a little bit what they do while we wait for this to be rolled out. Um, so let's start with metric beat. So this is um, by now familiar, the custom resource for beats, um, type metric beat, 
um, Elasticsearch ref, we've discussed this. The new thing here is the Kibana ref, which allows or instructs the operator to automatically connect this metric bit instance also with Kibana so that um, metric bit can install some dashboards into Kibana. Um, and what this um, YAML manifest is a slightly modified version from what we've done. So my colleague Michael is working on a blog post actually for the OpenShift blog, which will have the full manifests uh, for you to download very soon. And what this does, it targets specifically um, OpenShift's control plane. So we have done a few tweaks here to, to account for the uh, OpenShift namespace structure, for example, um, to extract metrics from the controller manager, from the scheduler, from core DNS, and so forth. Um, we're deploying this as a daemon set. So in that custom resource, you can choose how to deploy metric bit, you can either deploy it as a daemon set or as a deployment. In this case, we want to have this as a daemon set, um, which you can see here. So, and similarly, Firebit is basically the same idea. We've um, seen it now a couple of times. Um, use a different type here, it's Firebit, not metric bit, but otherwise very similar, using Elasticsearch ref to automate the setup of the connection. And then we're using a feature in Beats that's called Auto Discover, which is uh, for Kubernetes environments where pods come and go so that it automatically picks up the logs from these containers as they are created or stops picking them up once they are deleted. And again, it's, we're also deploying this as a daemon set. I think that's all you need to know for now. Um, let's take a look at the OpenShift console, what happened in while I was talking and see if they have been, the deployment has worked as it should. So we see the two daemon sets, one for Firebeat to extract the, the logs, one for metric beat. Um, they look okay, they look healthy. Um, so let's maybe take now a look back at Kibana and see if data is starting to flow. This can take a, a minute or two, but we already see um, log data is coming in and metrics data is coming in. Um, we can now, for example, zone in on the metrics and maybe um, slice and dice this a little bit differently by looking at Kubernetes pods, for example. There's many pods, so maybe group them by namespace. That looks better and maybe focus on our namespace here um I have to refresh this um so we see the deployed bots and we can maybe zone in onto the logs for this elastic search cluster and we see we uh can jump through and see the logs streaming in actually i can stream this live if i wanted to and see new logs coming in um similarly we could um if i go back one second we could also click through and, and get an overview of metrics. But this is sort of very generic. And uh, as if you remember what we did in the beginning, I said we also installed a instance of metric bit to monitor the Elasticsearch cluster directly. And this is where we get a richer set of metrics, um, what we call stack monitoring. For the elastic search cluster that we've deployed the individual nodes and so on and finally the last bit um, we deployed metric beat to monitor kubernetes itself and it uh, rolled out also a few dashboards um, that we should be able to see now and indeed um, we see six kubernetes nodes which is accurate the number of deployments we see data streaming in slowly we just deploy that and um, get stats about cpu usage memory usage network and um, we can also look at spe a specific dashboard for the kubernetes controller manager we can um, get metrics for the work queue um, and um, cpu again 
Now, one last thing. So we've seen, just to summarize what we've done, we've deployed Metropy to monitor Kubernetes and the hosts in this cluster, the Kubernetes control pane and the hosts in this cluster. We uh, deployed Fiverr to harvest all logs from all running containers. And I deployed stack monitoring to get a richer view for a specific application, in this case, the Elastic Search itself. Um, and we, we've seen how a rolling upgrade happened when I added additional metadata for the scraping of the metrics. Um, now, one thing, one last thing I want to show you is a, the new feature we added in, um, in, a, in version 1.3, which is inline or, or dynamic volume expansion, if you will. So imagine we've deployed this cluster, we're happy with this initial setup, but we realize we've under-provisioned these nodes slightly with only 50 gigs of, of storage space, and I want to fix that. How would you go about that? Well, if you just are using Kubernetes uh, stateful sets, you would have to create a new stateful set because the stateful set and its um, specification of the persistent volume claim are immutable. So you cannot change the capacity um, once you've provisioned it. But we've added a feature to work around this until well, there is a Kubernetes enhancement request to fix that in the stateful set controller. But until that lands, we've built in a workaround that allows you to directly go into this YAML spec as it's deployed. Just doing this in the OpenShift UI now. And just change this to, I don't know, 100 gigs instead of 50. Save the resource. And then let's maybe watch Kubernetes events. So what this does is it basically works around this limitation in stateful sets. It's, um, it's going to directly edit the persistent volume claim and then recreate um, the stateful set on on top of that to re-adopt these pods that have now been changed. You see the events flowing in that are already saying that the volume expansion succeeded here for this persistent volume claim. So if you go back to our stack monitoring view, we should um, see that Elasticsearch picks up this volume expansion without the need of a restart. So you see the first node, Elasticsearch ES default one, that's the master node, also has already picked up that change and the volume capacity has doubled without the need to recreate the nodes or uh, recreate the stateful set manually. I think that's all I wanted to show. It was a lot. Um, I think it's time maybe for questions now, if you have any. So there, there is one that someone's asked, um, uh, and it's about how to install Elastic plugins when using the operator. Um, there's, yeah, it's a good question. There's basically two ways, right? Um, so one is that you use an init container to um, to install the plugin before you um, start the main container, the main Elasticsearch container. Um, that of course has the disadvantage that you are susceptible to any kind of network glitch because it's it has to download the plugin every time it boots or restarts the pod. Um, so the alternative way that we uh, that we recommend is and this is actually also documented here on that on that um, on our in our documentation page is to create a custom Docker container. And you're free to create your own Docker container based on the official images, as long as they are based on the official images, um, and basically install the plugin at container creation time. And that's um, that's the, the second way of doing it. So this here is showing how to use an init container. Basically, you run a little set shell script that runs the installer. Um, and the alternative way is to use a custom image. We have a, a simple example here as well, how it, like a very simple two-line Docker image based on the official images to install it, which is probably recommended for more production-ready scenarios.
So that makes it easy, um, hopefully, for everybody here. Um, and we'll, we'll add that link to the page into the, the video so that you can find this um, later. Um, I, I had a question because I was reading through the what was in the latest release of um, of Elastic, and specifically in Kibana. Is um, is Kibana Lens um, part of the operator, or is that a plugin, or or can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that looked like really cool visualizations that got added into the latest release. And I know. Yes. That's... So uh, so what you get when you install the Elastic stack um, through the operator is just the regular version of Kibana as you would get it if you downloaded it from our website. So it's the basic licensed version. And yes, it comes also with Lens in order to visualize. Um, so if I create a new visualization here and click go to Lens, so it's already included um, um, in the package and I can, I don't know, start playing around with this. For example, to, to drag and drop some fields on the left hand side to create a graph here. In this case, it's uh, now showing me the count of records for each different host name. It's not the most imaginative use of it, but um, you can you can come up, of course, with your own um, uses. So, yeah, so that's, it, com that's it comes out of the box. Um, so when you get the yeah, idea, you have to do is, it's not a separate plugin, is I think what I was. No, it's, it's part of Kibana. Yeah, you get it uh, right away. So are there, in, in this latest release, are there other, like, I, I, I love this part because it makes it a bloody easy for me to create visualizations, even though you pick probably the most boring one we could pick. Um, <laughs> but I think, uh, are there other things that came in this latest release that you'd, um, you'd, you'd have like to point out? Because um, there's, there's a, I saw that, I read the whole thing and I'm like, there, there's a ton in this latest release. So. Uh... One, I mean, in the, in the latest 7.10 release, I think one of the more interesting features is sort of a formalization of the concept of data tiers. I think I spoke about this very briefly in the presentation so that you have these hot, warm, cold use cases where time, time series data is moved to cheaper hardware over time. Um, and the support for this has been formalized in the 7.10 release and even, um, extend it in, in such a way that you can back, uh, maybe I need to sort of step back a little bit. You, as you know, that data in Elasticsearch is organized in indexes and they uh, sort of um, uh, can be backed up in snapshots. So on, you can now, with the latest release, you can uh, search through these snapshots that are stored in very cheap storage, like think S3 from Amazon or something like that. So that gives you another very cost-effective way of organizing, of building these uh, multi-tier architectures with Elasticsearch clusters, where you move your data to cheaper and cheaper uh, data tiers as it becomes less relevant to you. Um, usually for log data, you're only interested in the last week's logs, right? So it's then after a week, then maybe you keep it around for the occasional root cause analysis. And then you know after another week, it's typically maybe you're only keeping it around for regulatory or audit purposes um, and you rarely ever look at it. So that's sort of this kind of use case is, is made much easier with the latest release. Um, so that, that actually is like one of the the wonderful use cases for sort of hybrid cloud and hybrid storage. I mean, pick pick your lowest common denominator for cost and, and store your stuff where it should be. So I think that's that's one of the sweet spots for, for cloud computing and taking advantage of it, that's a great thing. So I was wondering too, um, since this is the community side of OpenShift, um, tell, tell us a little bit about this is it's uh, this operator is available on operatorhub.io, which is you know the the community side as well as well as you've got a certified one. What are the differences between um, the community release of Elastic um, and this operator and the um, the the product side? Are, is there anything missing between the two of them, or how are they differentiated? If I'm just using the community pieces. Um, so the community, so there is, 
how to how to explain that so the community operator is basically identical to the certified operator and both allow you to run in a, in a free to use basic license which is what we we've seen today um, and both the community as well as the certified operator or the other download options we have if you download it from our website or you install it via helm it doesn't matter both all of these versions of the operator allow you to install a license into it and then you get all the commercial features in in the elastic stack uh, machine learning um, certain aspects of the observability features um, the security features and so forth um, so they no matter where you start there's uh, always a way to, to uh, sort of use these uh, commercial features if you need them and to upgrade and install a license into that so um, there's no 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 strong difference and you're not locked into one or the other if you if you start with the community operator or with any other option of downloading it that makes sense that that totally makes sense and that's actually nice to have that easy on ramp to getting to the pr the pro version or the the product version from the community is quite nice because i know um where i've heard the most about um, elastic recently being inside of red hat is around open data hub um, and that it's you know, elastic is one of the components in the, the reference architecture that um, open data hub was and i think they were using the community side initially and well, well i'm looking to see whether we can whether they're using the operator i haven't talked to the operator hub team in the recent weeks or months um, so it might be time to get them back on too to see you know and get their feedback how is the um so how long has this operator been available because i want to ask the question um uh what's the feedback you've gotten from customers on using the operator um, but if this is just been a, a few weeks here it might not be um um so we've had now you're asking me my memory serves me ill i think we had the ga what we call the ga version of the operator the 1.0 release i think was a january 2020 i hope i'm right yeah um, shuba's saying january 2020 so you your memory yes. is serving you correctly yeah but we had a beta version before that it goes i think back almost a year or so i, I don't, don't remember when we initially released it um so we had, I think, quite some time, quite some exposure to users. And I think the feedback has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. Uh, um, I think people are very happy with how it works, how it, um, how the orchestration works, and the, the automation we, we offer to make it easier to um, deploy complex topologies on Kubernetes. Um, so I think um, we're very happy with how this has turned out and how people have responded to it. So if, so, and, and you had said prior to us getting started that you were part of the team that built the operator. And um, what was that process like for, for Elastic? Um, I know, not just the certification stuff, but like the actual um, was, what advice would you give to someone now if they were starting down their operator journey, like besides read the documentation, <laughs> um, I guess it it was. I think for for many of us, it was um, the first time writing uh, any any operator in in Kubernetes. So it was, I think, a, a, a steep learning curve. Of course, um, you get familiar with the frameworks, making a choice. You know, there's different sort of operator frameworks out around. Um, eventually we settled on controller runtime and uh cube builder initially uh even though we have now replaced uh, parts of what Kubernetes automates away with sort of manual things we do um, um and i think it's really i mean my my colleague sebastian has given a, a quite good talk at a i think the last year's kubecon about the pitfalls of writing your own operator which summarizes our experience um, and sort of our journey um, to understanding how this works i mean just to give a few examples um, i think one thing we needed we, we realized um, during that process is the way you interact with the kubernetes api is usually through cached clients so there is no direct um, you know no direct request to the kubernetes api server and that of course is a 
measure they've taken in order to reduce load on the actual API server. So instead you have that cache locally in the application and that cache is synchronized from the API server. But that means whatever you do, whatever you, 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 whatever interaction you have with the Kubernetes API is sort of always a little bit behind the actual state of Kubernetes. So when you then build your operator, you sort of need to factor that into the algorithms you, you build in order to orchestrate Elasticsearch because you have to realize, okay, I see this pod now, but in reality, that pod might already have been deleted or maybe you don't see a pod that you expected to see, but that's maybe also a function of sort of this caching delay that comes through the Kubernetes um, client. So this is just one example of, of things we sort of um, discovered during that sort of development time and that we that we slowly sort of factored into whenever we built a new controller or a new, support a new application or a new stack application on the operator. Um, so I think by now we are sort of uh, aware of these pitfalls, but initially, of course, that was sort of something to, to work around. And of course, also things like designing your custom resource definition. You know, we went through multiple iterations of of um, trying to abstract away many many things um, and giving the user sort of a very high level uh, uh, toggle, so to speak, to to turn things on and off. And then, as I showed you during the presentation, we gradually moved back from that to a place where we expose actually. Um, a lot of the underlying abstractions directly in the CRD to give the user more power, more flexibility, and also to reduce cognitive overhead as we introduce concepts in the custom resource design. Every, users have to learn this, understand this, and um, so we in, eventually opted for removing a lot of that abstraction and sort of exposing also Elasticsearch configuration as directly as possible in the CRD. Because Many users of the operator are familiar with um, um, with Elasticsearch and they know how, what to put into the Elasticsearch configuration file. So we wanted to um, give them a similar experience here in Kubernetes where they could just apply what they already know and um, just plug that into that uh, manifest in that custom resource manifest um, as it as it were on a on an on-premise installation. Cool. And someone's just added in the writing a Kubernetes operator, the hard parts that Sebastian wrote, uh, did. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll put that in the notes too. Um, so linking in the YouTube video that I post later from the session. So um, um, we're, we're almost to the end of the hour here. I'm wondering, um, it's sort of in a closing thing, um, ask because me, I, I'm totally uh, focused on helping people build their operators. So, um, and whether it's for Elastic or Tremolo Securities, Open Unison, but really hearing people's feedback on, on the operator, the operator framework and things. So thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything coming in the Elastic roadmap, a new feature or functionality that you, we should keep an eye out for in the upcoming releases or something. What are you working on now that's gonna make it even more um, so I, I can't speak for sort of the overall elastic roadmap. I know what we are working on for the operator. That's maybe something I can talk about a little bit. So of course we are trying to bring more stack applications uh, onto the operator. So there is a new thing coming out which is called the elastic agent, which is a way of bundling together uh, these different beats into one binary. So instead of what I what you saw during the demo that I had to deploy metric beats separately from file beat and there are other beats as well. Um, so in the future, Elastic Agent will allow you to just deploy one binary and um, then the different sort of harvesting capabilities, so it's just configuration of the agent. So that's something we're looking into supporting. Um, eventually, um, we're also looking into sort of some form of auto-scaling capabilities for the operator um, and um, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes is also a sort of um, you know, I referenced Elastic Cloud Enterprise as the on-premise product, which has a UI, which has APIs. Um, in sort of in the far future, we want to sort of close the, the gap here between these two products and give you a similar experience as well with a UI maybe and some UIs, uh, APIs. So we did get one more question from the live stream. Um, this is uh, uh, 
how would I handle selection of against specific nodes or in more detail to deploy Elasticsearch operator on a dedicated infra nodes? Is it preferred to configure the tolerations for taints on the deployment config of Elk or do it on the operator config itself? Um, that's a complicated question. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I think I'm reading this as a question how to so the operator itself, of course, so if you install it via operator hub, it's all managed by uh, the operator lifecycle manager. So the namespace it lands into is sort of predetermined. I think that's not the question. I think the person is asking about how to influence where the Elasticsearch nodes land on. And so there, and there you can, you can use node selectors, you can use any feature that sort of Kubernetes offers you to target that. And you would do that as I, I think I showed this briefly. I don't know if I have the slides still up through the through the pod template. I'm just going back here. For example, um, through node affinity, um, or you can um, use a node selector. Um, so everything that Kubernetes offers you to target a specific node or exclude nodes, uh, you can use here because we're directly exposing the pod template here. Perfect. I hope that answered their question. Um, I think it really might have, so that's good. Um, if you could, if you have a final slide, um, if you could pop over to that so people know where to find Elastic, though that's not hard, elastic.co, and where to find you guys, um, that's probably um, a good one to end on, and we'll... I only have a slide with our GitHub repository on, but I think from, if you go there, you'll. Uh, the website is linked as well. Perfect. So I hope that works too. That works fine. I'm going to make you send me your slides so I can attach that with the, the YouTube video as well. And I think we are pretty much at the end of our hour. I'm going to pause for a few seconds and see if anyone else pops in with another question. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to let you go back to your evening because um, you're in Vienna. And I'll grab another coffee and make sure I get this wonderful um, walkthrough of the Elastic um, world uh, view of things um, up on YouTube for everybody later today. And um, we'll definitely have you back with the next release. And I'm going to have to go, I'm now I'm really going to have to go play with the Cabana lens um, because now you've made it dead easy and I have no excuse. Um, to not to not make beautiful visuals, even though you only showed us the bar. I saw some demos um, earlier at, with like just beautiful mapping and also interesting, really interesting stuff. So there's there's a whole uh, whole world of uh, visualization that you've opened up to, and made much easier for folks. So I, I totally appreciate that. And we'll have to uh, work out with the Open Data Hub team too. Um, them getting some nice visualizations added in, um, which I've seen a few, but um, this I think this really is gonna expand upon all this and you've made it dead easy for people to deploy it now on OpenShift and elsewhere on Kubernetes. So this is kudos to you and the whole team over at Elastic. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, thanks so much for having me. All right, take, a, take care Peter and everybody else, stay safe and have a great week. Thank you, bye now.